Hello. Uh, so far, we've been looking at uh, the challenges uh, in uh, face modulated sensors and uh, uh, overcoming some of those challenges. And in the last lecture, we looked at uh, overcoming environmentally induced uh, face noise, and uh, that uh, is uh, done through uh, a face generated carrier technique, uh, which I had mentioned was uh, introduced by uh, Dandridge et al in their uh, IEEE JQA paper in 1982. Uh, so, we were just reviewing this uh, technique uh, yesterday and uh, we were saying that one example of where this technique could be useful is uh, the design of a hydrophone. So, we were looking at the case where uh, you need to pick up uh, acoustic signals, uh, let us say in the order of uh, 100 hertz and uh, uh, so these are essentially pressure variations. So, uh, if you were to pick it up using an optical sensor, we said uh, essentially a face modulated sensor may be uh, 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 quite appropriate for this application, wherein um, the pressure waves uh, cause change in the uh, refractive index of uh, an optical fiber through what is called the strain optic uh, coefficient. And whenever the refractive index changes, we know that the uh, phase of the light going through this uh, optical fiber is going to change. And so, we are essentially converting pressure changes to uh, phase changes uh, in this uh, hydrophone application. And uh, of course, uh, we know that our uh, receiver, optical receiver is not able to perceive um, phase changes. So, we need to convert these phase changes to uh, intensity changes and that we do using an interferometer. And uh, one example of that is uh, what we have shown here is a Maxender interferometer and um, wherein one of the arms is the measurement arm uh, which is exposed to these uh, acoustic signals and the other arm is a reference arm. And uh, one thing that we said was uh, if you want to pick this uh, acoustic signal from uh, this uh, noisy background, uh, we could potentially introduce uh, a phase, uh, deliberately introduce a phase uh, variation. Uh, so, sinusoidal uh, phase variation uh, in the reference, it can be accomplished using a, a piezoelectric transducer. And then we went on to look at the math of this and uh, uh, we recognized that uh, what we are essentially doing is uh, any phase variation that we have uh, over here, uh, this part is, is actually uh, because of this uh, uh, phase carrier that we are uh, uh, introducing, we are converting uh, this phase information into uh, amplitude information, right? Uh, through these, uh, you know, when we do a cos of cos, we uh, represent that in terms of Bessel functions and which are tagged. Uh, the Bessel components are tagged to specific frequency. So, we get an output. Uh, uh, spectrum uh, like this, uh, wherein uh, the relative amplitudes of the uh, uh, even and odd uh, frequency components, where Fc corresponds to the carrier frequency that we have uh, uh, chosen, typically in the order of 10 kilohertz or so, uh, but, but the magnitude of the uh, uh, the ratio of uh, this uh, uh, even and odd components is uh, what is going to give us the uh, phase information that we are looking for. Um, so, thought we could uh, go into this in a little more detail today and, uh, and see uh, specifically how this uh, uh, phase is extracted. Okay, so, that is what we are going to do. So, let us let us continue from where we left off yesterday. So, let us actually look at um, you know it is easy enough to say that the, the phase information that you need is, is actually sitting over here uh, in the sine and cos which corresponds to these uh, uh, frequency terms. But uh, how do you read those uh, values and how do you specifically extract phi of t? Okay, that is what we want to look at. So, um, 
so let's let's go back and look uh, just uh, uh, quickly uh, draw this uh, picture and and so we can see where exactly we are at so this is our uh, laser the source laser like i said what type of laser we will uh, come back and uh, uh, look at in a minute And then uh, we are going into our uh, optical uh, receiver, right? So this is our uh, 3dB coupler or 50-50 coupler. This is also 50-50 coupler. And then uh, we are basically saying this uh, hydrophone is uh, wound around a mandrel. So you have a mandrel around which you uh, basically wind your uh, uh, fiber coil. And similarly, on the uh, reference side, you have uh, a PZT element, okay, which can uh, allow us, and, and you have the fiber wound around it, okay, so, uh, so the PZT can stretch or contract and uh, accordingly uh, impart uh, strain changes on the fiber, which uh, once again uh, changes the uh, uh, refractive index in the face in the other arm. So why do we want to do that? Well, uh, we said you to, we need to extract uh, these uh, specific uh, frequency components. So what we are interested in is um, these components, right? So we are interested in extracting those uh, specific components. So the way we can do this is uh, uh, we can basically take the receiver output and uh, beat it like we did previously for lock-in detection. We can beat it with uh, uh, essentially the FC uh, uh, and, and two FC uh, signals. So, uh, how do we generate FC? Basically, you have uh, uh, let's say a frequency synthesizer that uh, gives us this uh, FC, and uh, this is what we are applying to this uh, 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 to this PZT so that we can uh, realize this uh, phi c uh, cos of uh, omega c t right uh, omega c corresponds to 2 pi f c right and uh, we use the same source as a reference uh, to beat uh, uh, with the uh, receive signal so that we can extract the uh, FC component and similarly you can take a derivative uh, or, or you can derive uh, you can do a go through a frequency multiplier you can derive a uh, harmonic of that uh, frequency uh, to get uh, 2 FC and if you beat with that uh, we can extract uh, the components like we talked about uh, these these components okay so when we do this beating what exactly are we getting let's examine that a little more closely so when you beat with fc right that's an odd integral multiple so what does that correspond to uh, so you come over here and uh, this corresponds to the, all the odd integral multiples so when k equal to 0 right that's when you get uh, uh, basically the uh, fc component right and uh, so when when k equal to 0 this is actually j1 of uh, phi c and uh, so this goes to 1 and you have a negative sign outside so and and this entire thing is multiplied by b so uh, so we can write this as uh, so when you beat uh, with uh, FC, right? The component that we get is minus B times, uh, let's say, uh, the strength of uh, this uh, uh, signal generator is such that uh, the, the strength of the beating signal corresponds to some factor G, okay? And uh, uh, so what we are extracting is J1 of uh, phi C, right? multiplied by uh, 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 
you know you have the cos omega c term which beats with this uh, uh, this cos omega c term here uh, from the reference and so you get something uh, near dc and uh, and what we are left with is uh, sorry so what we, what we are left with is uh, so you get a j1 phi c and then you have a, a sin phi of t term right similarly if you uh, beat with uh, 2 times fc okay you can go back and uh, look at which component we are going to pick up we are going to be picking up uh, uh, from from this component so uh, so 2 times fc corresponds to k equal to 1 uh, so you have a j2 of ic and k equal to 1 there is a minus sign that is coming out and uh, so you have essentially minus b times the let us say the strength of this 2 fc component is, uh, uh, is, is given by h. So, you have j2 of phi c and that is associated with cos of uh, phi of t right. So, uh, now, uh, what we are really interested in is phi of t. So, you can basically say mathematically I take these signals and I can uh, 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 you know uh, take basically if you take the ratio of these signals uh, uh, then that will actually give me tan of uh, uh, phi of t and then you can do a tan inverse uh, to get phi of t and all that. So, that is nice to say. <coughs> So, for example, if you have some digital signal processing, you can possibly, uh, uh, you have a computer, you can possibly compute uh, that, that term. But if you want to suppose uh, extract the signal uh, in an analog form itself, how can we do that? Well, we can do that by um, a, a principle that we uh, can call as uh, differentiate and uh, cross multiply. So, what does this uh, differentiate and uh, cross multiply uh, 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 scheme is all about? Well, uh, you uh, what we have coming in is uh, let us let us number these things. Um, so, let us call this number 1 and let us call this number 2. Okay, so, you have uh, number 1 coming here and number 2 coming here, we are just continuing from uh, uh, these are essentially what we get uh, over here 1 and uh, uh, 2 right. So, so let us let us continue that here. So, if you take that and uh, you uh, put it through a differentiator, differentiate with respect to uh, time. <coughs> and then you go into a cross multiply uh, term. So, what does this cross multiply do? We will just see that in a minute. Okay. Um, so, you essentially take this signal and you are uh, uh, cross multiplying with this and uh, and similarly, uh, we can take uh, this signal and uh, cross multiply with this term. So, first of all and so, let us let us look at uh, uh, what is happening with uh, uh, 1 right. So, let us let us say the output of this is 3 and this is 4. So, let us actually examine what these uh, outputs represent. So, when you differentiate um, uh, you know this this incoming signal 1 with respect to uh, uh, time, uh, what you get is uh, minus b times uh, g j 1 of i c which is actually a constant right multiplied by uh, you have a, a sign of phi t. So, that is just going to give you cos of uh, phi t right and uh, then you have uh, basically 
a d phi over uh, d t term as well, right? So when you, when you do this differentiation. So similarly, when you do this uh, 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 differentiation, in the the lower arm, um, you have a, uh, a uh, cos of phi t which you are differentiating. So, you are going to give a minus, you are going to get a minus sign. So, what you are going to get is plus times b times h j 2 of phi c which is actually a constant value for a given value of uh, phi c and then you have sin of uh, phi of t d phi over d t. Okay? So, now, uh, what you do is you're you're just going to cross multiply uh, this with uh, uh, two, right? Because uh, you're you're taking uh, this and you're cross multiplying with two. So when you do the cross multiply, um, you get or rather I'll just. Uh, I'll just uh, 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 give you the output. So, uh, if you take 3 and you cross multiply with uh, 2, what you get is uh, b square uh, g h uh, j 1 of, uh, of phi c uh, cos square of uh, phi of t d phi over uh, d t and similarly, if you take uh, 4 and you cross multiply with 1, you get uh, minus b square g h sorry, uh, there should be a j 1 of phi c and then there should also be a j 2 of uh, phi c. So, you get the same term here j 1 of phi c, j 2 of uh, phi c and here it is going to be sin square phi of t and uh, you get a d phi by d t. Okay? So, uh, so let us let us call this uh, uh, this as five and uh, this as six. So, if you do uh, phi minus six, what do you get? Um, you you essentially have the uh, uh, the negative term becoming positive, so you have a cos square plus sin square term, and rest of them are all common. So you get a b square g h j one of phi c j two of uh, phi c multiplied by cos square plus sin square, which uh, essentially uh, goes to one. So, you just have uh, d phi by d t. So, what we are essentially doing is taking this output here and putting it through a subtractor and at the output of this you get uh, this. So, what do we need to do now to get your to extract your phi of t? Well, you just have to put it through an integrator. right? So, so this is this is actually a subtractor circuit and this is an integrator circuit and so what you get out of this let me just put arrows for all this so it's clear which way the signals are going right so what you what you get out of this is essentially phi of t right so you you go through that uh, final step so uh, from this integrate to extract phi of t right so um, that is essentially uh, the the way you can uh, uh, go ahead and uh, uh, try to um, uh, you know extract extract this uh, phi of t so, uh, let us do a quick recap on uh, what we have been talking about. Uh, so, we have been looking at how to extract this uh, phase changes uh, phi of t and uh, uh, 
uh, and, and of course, we uh, realize that we're going to have to do this uh, differentiate and cross multiply scheme uh, to extract uh, phi of t. Um, let us just talk about uh, uh, how to optimize uh, uh, this uh, phi of t. Okay. So, uh, to optimize this, uh, we need to take care of all these uh, factors uh, j1, j2, uh, B, G and H and all of that. So, let us just look into uh, all of this one by one. Let us first look at the uh, Bessel components. So, what do these Bessel components mean? Well, you can draw uh, this uh, Bessel function uh, J of phi C as a function of phi C. Um, so, if you draw the different Bessel functions, so let us say you start with J naught. J naught is actually going to be uh, an oscillatory component with the exponential uh, decay of the envelope and uh, then you look at J1, J1 is going to start from 0 and then uh, uh, so, so J0 actually starts uh, from a value of 1 whereas uh, J1 starts from a value of 0 and then once again it is oscillatory but it does not swing as much as J0 does and then J2 is uh, another oscillatory function, but uh, that does not go up as much as uh, J1. So, it is uh, relatively smaller in amplitude, but it is uh, that is also decaying and, and oscillating. Now, uh, the, the question is uh, what is the optimum value of uh, phi c that you can choose. Uh, remember phi c is something that is uh, up to you because you actually send a voltage uh, from your uh, signal generator to drive your PZT and the voltage should be such a value like a, you can call this VC. Uh, so, such a value that it incorporates a certain uh, phi C uh, through this uh, uh, PZT. So, then the question is what should be that phi C? Now, the phi C should be such that uh, when um, you uh, have small changes in phi c. Let us say it is uh, although you give a very specific voltage to get a very specific phase point, the voltage might have some uh, small uh, changes like it might go from 2.59 uh, uh, to 2.61, it may be fluctuating by about 0 0.01 uh, radian. If there is any such changes, it should not uh, cause a big change in the uh, phase that you are trying to extract. So, you choose a point such that if it goes uh, less than that value, let us say it goes 2.59, J1 is increasing, J2 is decreasing. So, when you are looking at the product of J1 and J2, that is constant. Okay. And similarly, if uh, this phi c value goes up to uh, 0 0.01 higher, it goes to 2.61, j2 is increasing, j1 is decreasing. Once again, the product is not going to change as much. So, you look for these uh, crossover points between uh, j1, j2. So, there is one crossover point here, another crossover point here, another crossover point here and so on. So, so, you can conveniently choose this crossover point, so that uh, uh, that will be your optimum bias point, so that any small changes in small fluctuations in phi c should not uh, change the uh, overall uh, uh, phi value that you are trying to pick up. And, uh, and then it comes to, uh, you know, optimizing the value of uh, g and h. Okay. How do you optimize the value of G and H? Now, when you think about the final power value that you are reading, this phi of t you are reading, uh, phi of t should you are typically designed for a certain range. There is a maximum phi value uh, for which you design this sensor. Okay. Let us say that maximum phi value is 1 radian. Okay. So, it should be such that this uh, final phi of t that you are getting is actually a voltage value. Okay. So, that voltage should uh, fill your ADC. So, if your ADC is say um, ADC is 1 volt, then uh, that 1 volt should uh, correspond to 1 radian, if 1 radian is the maximum phase that you are trying to pick up. Okay. So, 
so you need to fill your adc so to fill your adc you can use uh, you can actually uh, change the value of g and h what does g and h represent g represents the strength of the signal that's coming here h represents the strength of the signal that's that's coming here right so uh, you can actually change those voltages so that you can increase the uh, signal that you are uh, final signal that you are getting such that it uh, fills the uh, adc right so that's how you uh, go about choosing g and h and uh, finally um, you want to choose b carefully so let's actually uh, see what b represents to see that you need to go back and uh, look at your uh, uh, the original where we all where it all started we said we are looking at this beat function the strength of that beat is what we are calling as b right so that's what we used in these uh, expressions uh, we uh, this b is representing this value and when you look at this closely it consists of the degree of coherence which you of course uh, try to increase as much as uh, possible you try to choose uh, a laser which is uh, relatively narrow line width so you can uh, um, get uh, a fairly high degree of coherence close to 1 uh, if possible and uh, then you have the relative values of i1 and i2 so how do you choose i1 and i2 well uh, to start with you in an interferometer to get maximum contrast you try to get i1 to be matching i2 okay so you can adjust the uh, intensities in the two arms by adjusting the losses in the two arms so you can balance i1 and i2 okay so that is uh, one thing we do and uh, overall it's controlled by the intensity from the uh, laser so you can uh, um, you can you can actually this this uh, if you call it i naught you can adjust i naught so that you can adjust uh, i1 and i2 as well um, but what should those values be well we understand that in our uh, receiver you have uh, what is called short noise okay so what is short noise uh, due to it's because of the random arrival time of photons at the uh, at the receiver and uh, that actually scales with uh, the short noise variance scales with the uh, input power or the input intensity of light that's that's uh, that's incident on the detector okay so you need to reduce uh, the intensity i1 and i2 such that you can reduce the short noise component but if you reduce this to a too small a value let's say you go down to nanowatts of power okay in that case you need to actually boost up your signal by having a large gain for your receiver and in in that case you have a, a thermal noise component that comes the, that comes into the picture so you need to essentially adjust i1 I and i2 so that you can balance this short noise and thermal noise uh, so that you can achieve uh, as high a signal to noise ratio as possible okay and uh, by adjusting i1 and i2 you are adjusting b and uh, through that you are uh, essentially uh, making sure you get a, a relatively uh, clean signal okay so you can you can extract uh, this uh, uh, phi of t uh, in in a reliable manner okay um, having said that uh, we do have to be careful about uh, 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 this phi of t as we defined a little earlier it corresponds to uh, phi s cos omega s t this is the signal that we want to extract but there is still noise incorporated in that we are reducing the noise as much as possible through uh, this lock in detection and and uh, low pass filtering uh, that is something that i did not explicitly mention uh, previously when you do this uh, beating you also need to incorporate this low pass filter before you extract this one and two so by uh, low pass filtering uh, uh, to essentially include the essential components like uh, if you are trying to pick up something at 100 hertz then uh, you do a low pass filter around that 
so that uh, uh, you are not actually accumulating a lot of noise uh, from higher frequencies. Okay. So, so you need to use uh, the slow pass filtering judiciously. On the other hand, if you uh, know that your uh, you know acoustic signal that is uh, incident on this, right? if the acoustic signal that is incident on this uh, 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 hydrophone, if you know it is going to be at 100 hertz let us say, then instead of a low pass filter you can actually use a band pass filter. Okay, and, uh, and and then just pick up that 100 hertz component or uh, even better uh, you can uh, beat it instead of FC you can beat it with FC plus 100 hertz or something like that and uh, then you can extract the specific component corresponding to an, and 2 FC will correspond to 2 FC uh, uh, plus this uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, 100 hertz or 200 hertz uh, uh, those components and then you can extract the specific frequencies of interest uh, uh, for us. Okay. So, so those are some of the modifications you can do to uh, reduce the noise further, but uh, that is essentially uh, what this uh, phase generated carrier method is all about. Um, of course, uh, I want to acknowledge that uh, most of this material is coming from this uh, 1982 paper um, you know that is uh, in journal of uh, quantum electronics in 1982 is when this uh, scheme was uh, first uh, uh, proposed and uh, uh, by Dandridge et al. And, uh, uh, and they were uh, looking at these uh, uh, picking up phase values in the presence of low frequency random the temperature and uh, pressure fluctuations right uh, so that's what they want to uh, uh, you know deal with and uh, they are targeting you know 10 radians to 10 power minus 6 radian type of range and uh, to achieve that uh, they are uh, essentially proposing this phase generated carrier technique which involves uh, using this piezoelectric uh, phase modulators um, right and this is all the math that we went through uh, uh, you know uh, previously so all that all that uh, comes from this uh, this paper here and uh, uh, once we have this uh, cos phi t uh, sin phi t terms so then you do this uh, cross uh, uh, differentiate and cross multiply scheme uh, first you do the beating and you get the um, fc and uh, 2 fc components and then you do the cross uh, uh, differentiate uh, step and then the cross multiply step and then your subtraction and then finally you integrate to get the uh, phi of t term and uh, here are some uh, uh, some sample waveforms that they acquired experimentally at that time uh, this is actually for a condition where um, your uh, uh, fc component is dominant compared to this 2 fc component so this is uh, closer to uh, quadrature and uh, this is actually a case where uh, your 2 fc and 0 uh, the dc components are uh, dominant compared to the FC component. So, this corresponds to a case where uh, phi uh, is, uh, is closer to 0. right? So, um, of course, they talk about this uh, beating at the FC and 2 FC uh, uh, to get their, uh, uh, the, those beat components and then they talk about uh, how to do this uh, uh, differentiate and cross multiply scheme to uh, extract uh, phi of t and uh, what they uh, mentioned there is they are able to get to about 10 power minus 6 radians to about uh, 1 radian in, in, in their work which is of course uh, has been this was almost uh, 40 years ago. So, it has been uh, improved since then, uh, but, but they also make another important point which is uh, what is the minimum detectable limit as far as this uh, 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 phase generated carrier technique is concerned, what is it really limited by? What they observe is limited by the fluctuation of the emission uh, frequency of the source. If you have a single frequency uh, source, then you have a single phase uh, 
very definite phase associated with it. But if your source is actually having multiple frequencies, then the phase actually does not uh, become deterministic. There is some uncertainty in the phase itself. And that uncertainty is going to constitute the minimum detectable limit as far well as the phase detection is concerned. So, not so surprisingly that detectable limit in terms of phase is proportional to delta nu, where delta nu correspond to the uh, spread in the frequencies of your uh, source. So, we will look into this aspect a little more detail uh, possibly in the next lecture. Okay. So, that is what we have uh, a phase generated carrier technique to, uh, to pick up uh, uh, phase changes in the presence of environmentally induced uh, phase noise. Mm -hmm.